Welcome back to another Pine of Pint podcast. This week, we have been joined by hard-hitting defender Craig Armstrong. Make sure you're giving us a like and a subscribe. It's completely free. But let's get on with Craig. Although we will pay you for it. <laughs> right, we'll, uh, we'll kick straight off if that's all right, Craig. So thank you, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. And I just want to start right at the beginning of your career and then sort of how you got into being a professional footballer, if that's all right. Um, where do I start? So I'm originally from the North East. Um, I was born in South Shields, uh, brought up in Durham. So you'll you'll hear a mixture of a sort of mixed accent. I've been in Nottingham since I was 16. Yeah. So um, I didn't start playing football until I was 12. Um, I played rugby from the age of seven till I think it was under 12s. And um, my school didn't really have a school team. So I think I played one game in a school team, played against a side where we got beat something like 9-0. <laughs> the... the the head teacher or the teacher of that team ran a district side. We had trials for a district. I got in the district side. So that was sort of an under 12s. I think we played two games, one against a Chelsea street, and one against um, Sunderland district. And I think it just all snowballed from there. So we played Chelsea street district district first. I think I had four or five clubs ask me to go on trial. So I think I'd only have to play two games of football. Really? Uh, yeah, so I think we played one school game, one district game, then I got asked to go to Forest, Arsenal, um, Newcastle, Sunderland, Middlesbrough on trial. But as it happened, um, I got asked to play for a Sunday side, which was a team called Hilda Parker. They're actually still going at the moment, based in Chelsea Street. And the manager of Hilda Park was actually Colin Todd, the ex-Derby um, yeah. England International. Yeah. And his son, Andy, Played in the same team. Uh, there's a lad called Mickey Barry who played for Middlesbrough and played for Hartlepool for many years. Who played? It was it was a breeding ground for Middlesbrough, really, sort of like a, a, a Middlesbrough affiliation. Um, so I went home with my dad. I was asked to play for the Sunday side, and I was told it was because Andy Todd had, had Osgood Slatters, so he wasn't going to be able to play for the remainder of the season. So I wanted to play everything. I wanted to play football. I wanted to play rugby, and, and my dad said, "No, nah, you can't do that. One or the other." Yeah. And I'd been playing rugby for five years and that wasn't bad. So I decided uh, I'll play football then. And my me, me dad was a little bit pissed off, if you would say. He was a little <laughs> bit upset about it. I mean, my me, me dad's a big footballing person, but he just, because I'd played rugby and, and he couldn't find a sort of a football side for me when I was young. So I, I decided to go and play for the park. And as it happened, Andy didn't bother having any rest. He just kept playing as well. So you'd have Andy Todd in midfield with myself. Um, Greg Bruce Rock's son played for us, Gregory Rock. So we had a, like a, a mixture of some good young talent. Mm. So in, in the North East, you had obviously um, Wars End Boys Club, you had, which is obviously renowned for bringing people through, uh, Alan Shearer and people like that. Yeah. I think Paul Gascoigne. But you had Hilda Park, where there was a lot of affiliation boys who, who went to Middlesbrough. There was another one called Lambton Worms, where the, all the lads went to Sunderland. So obviously things have changed now in academies. I know you'll have spoken to a lot of people who work in football clubs. You, you could go on trial anywhere. So you could go on trial to you at 13, 14, 15. You would mm. sign associate school boys at under 14s. Um, and then you'd sign lots sort of scholarship at 16s. So for your 17, 18, then you sign a pro at sort of 17, 18. Yeah. So as it happened, I, that's how I sort of fell into football. So it just snowballed from there. I went to Middlesbrough Centre of Excellence. So if I went to a, a forest sort of academy now, I couldn't go to any other football club. Yeah. Back then, I was at middle of the centre of I was still going on trial at Nottingham Forest. I went to Arsenal. I went to Man United. You know, Sunderland, Newcastle. Um, and as it happened, Forest were the team that sort of was good. It treated you well. It, it sort of... It, it was it was a good football club, a good grounding. And um, I could have signed for Sunderland and I'm a big Sunderland fan. Mm. And the trials were crap. It was, the, ta- the trials were terrible. I just didn't enjoy it. And um, as it happened, I ended up Signing for Nottingham Forest, and um, it was, I suppose the best decision I ever made. Really, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I think how every player we speak to when they talk about like their initial, you know, how they got into the game, it it's so much more of like a magical kind of TV style story. You know, how they, they're playing football, they get scouted, mm-hmm. and it's. I just find it so crap how it is now. Like kids getting picked up at seven or whatever, and then 
just funneled down an academy scheme playing against other seven-year-olds until the 15 and then, oh, you're not good enough, sorry, nine times out of ten, if not more. Yeah. And it's just such a different world, I think, that you've got now. Like, if, if you know any of our kids wanted to be footballers, they'll never have that experience you did, Craig, of playing effectively with mates or whoever or, or, or school and some guy in a flat cap on the side going, oh, yeah, crap. Craig Armstrong is quite good. It's just a better way of... It's, it's just better, isn't it? I don't know how to put it into yeah, words. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so you talk about um, sort of old recruitment to new recruitment. Yeah. So I work, in, I work in recruitment now, so I work for a football club now, and I, we'll talk about that a bit later, but mm. um, I, I went on trial to different clubs and I signed for Nottingham Forest because... Colin Todd, who was assistant manager at Middlesbrough at the time, who was my Sunday league manager, mm. told me it would be the best thing I ever did. Mm. So I, I I went down to Nottingham Forest and, and like like everyone did, Steve Guinan was the same, I think. He, he met Brian Clough and sort of they made you feel welcome. I got offered a five-year contract at at 14-year-old to sign for Forest. It was a two-year scholar. So a two-year schoolboy, two-year scholar and a one-year pro. And Middlesbrough backed it and said, listen, we'll... we'll, we'll We'll match it. We'll give you what Forrest had given you. And I was in a meeting with Bruce Rielk and Colin Todd at the time and we're having a conversation and and, and Colin just said, like, like, yeah, yeah, this we want you to stay. You can, you can play with Andy and, you know, you can go stay at home with your mum and dad and, you know, you, you like it at the football club. It's a really good... And it was a good club, a fantastic club. Yeah. So they were trying to get me to sign for the football club. And when I decided, oh, listen, I'll go make... A, I'll, I'll think about it over the weekend and, and make a decision what I wanted to do. And Colin said, oh, I'll walk you to the car. So he followed my mum and dad out. And and um, obviously, because I had a good relationship with Colin and, and his son, and I used to go around his house for tea and, and stuff like that. Mm. He, he he said, don't come here. Go and sign for Middlesbrough. Go and sign for Nottingham Forest. Be the best thing you ever do. Go, for, go and play for Brian Clough. Yeah. Because I respected him immensely, I went, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's how it actually happened. And funny enough... Um, my scout, Bill Emery, who, who passed away quite a few years ago, he, he brought in a lot of talented players from the northeast. Bill turned up at my house one day. Um, my mum and dad didn't tell me, but I knew he was a scout because he got out the car with a forest tie on and he had this big, massive car. And when I signed for the club, you couldn't sign till you were 14. And I'm a mere birthday, end of mere birthday. And what he did is he I signed the contract in January of my 13th year. And right. he just said, we'll just stick it in a draw. Are you all right with that? I said, yeah, I'm fine with that. <laughs> so I signed for Forest when I shouldn't have. So you got right. in a draw and, and and that's how I ended up sort of joining the football club, yeah. which you talk about, you mentioned earlier about the recruitment side of it and it is getting difficult. The thing is, money now is so huge in the game yeah. that every club wants to get the best talent they can. Yeah. The problem you're in, you, the problem you're that could happen is that kids playing football at six year old with the mates like we spoke about, it's enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. The problem is you've got now is every every kid wants to be a footballer and they see the money, they see the wealth, they see the line light, they see the TV. Kids fall out with fo- fall out with love with football. It becomes a lot harder and a lot more ruthless. I don't think there's any more players making it professional now to what it was when I came through. The difference is the kids get an unbelievable upbringing now, coaching, mm. um, yeah. sports science, nutrition, sort of um, sort of care, family care, <coughs> really looked after by sort of a well-being person at the football club, depending on what club you're at. you just looked after immensely. Yeah. That's it. I mean, football's so huge now that these clubs can't afford to miss out on the next whoever, can they? So that, that's anyone who's got half a chance of making it, they... They snap them up and, and coach them, and you know that that's just the way it is. But yeah, it does. You don't really get your, your sort of fairy tale stories that Luke were talking about. Although you do still get a few sort of Jamie Vardy's and, and players like that who who come through later. But it's certainly rarer, I think, now than than it was back in sort of nineties. Yeah, but I think the likes of a Jamie Vardy is um, a prime example. You know, he talks about him being a little bit too small. Yeah, or you speak to people around the club. He might have been a bit of a nightmare of a kid as well. Which mm. you have this, you know, he's coming from a sort of a working 
class city, you know, tough, tough, tough upbringings, you know, not a lot of money in certain areas. And, but Jamie Vardy is possibly the player he is today because he went on a different journey. Yeah. It wasn't straightforward for him. He, he went to Stocksbridge, was playing at Stocksbridge while he was 16, getting kicked around off men, then moving to Halifax and then doing it again, then moving to Fleetwood and doing it again. And yeah. I mean, the, he just keeps getting better and better as he gets older. And, you know, I think if Jamie Vardy had been given a scholarship at Sheffield Wednesday, I don't think you'd have a Jamie Vardy now. No, very possibly not. I mean, we just had um, Paul Devlin on, Craig, literally, yeah. just earlier today. And um, it, we had a very similar discussion about that. And it, it was explaining, just like you have really, that, you know, we talk about kids now. Yeah, they get a great upbringing. They might be supremely talented and everything. But if they're not getting that level of football that the likes of Vardy got at maybe 21, 22, playing against some six foot two experienced defenders booting him as he were trying to run past him as opposed to people just in his age group and then he's under 23 level and it's such a different way where the world you've got to imagine the the experience is better for making it as a pro doing what doing it that way yeah, yeah possibly but i think there's a lot of good footballers that aren't playing at the top level yeah and there's probably one thing that's that puts Jamie Vardy and, and the, the, the lads who play at the top level for the longest time and, and for longevity is their mental strength their desire their commitment yeah you know listen there's a lot of talented players that I've played with and you'll speak to a lot of footballers that played with some unbelievable talent who just mm. never made it yeah because they didn't have the, the the passion or the commitment or the desire or or just they couldn't cope with different circumstances or knockbacks or setbacks where, you know, I was lucky where I didn't realise what I had until I was probably 25, 26 or realised that you have to be really fit to make a, a good footballer. I was very fortunate that, that it happened. People ask me, what do you remember about how you got to where you got to? And it's like, I don't, it's gone too quick. I, I don't know how I got there where had I been in now, in the now and the coaching and the understanding what it takes to be the football, the nutrition, the gym sessions, yeah. I would have been better for it. But would I have been any better or would I have had longevity? I don't know. Mm. Because I had knockbacks, I had setbacks, I was spoken to like crap from managers. I was treated poorly at times. Yeah. And you have to come through that. There's a way, you've got to find a way. If you don't find a way, you, you just, it's bullying. Yeah. You could yeah. talk about it being bullying. And the likes of it, uh, like again, Jamie Vardy, because he's the prime one that you talk about and where he ended up and, and where he finished and where he's still going. Yeah. It's just that desire and mm. just wants to keep improving every day and just loves playing football. Yeah. And, you know, David Beckham's, you know, the wealthiest footballers still want to run around a football pitch and want to work hard. It's not about the money. No. And that's the difference. That's what sets the best players from from the not so good players. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can have all the talent if you're not going to apply yourself and and really want it, really go for it. Um, I think it, when we were talking to Paul, like Ravel Morrison's name cropped up and he would talked about as being yeah. the most talented out of a, a bunch of very talented footballers like Pogba and Lingard players like that were in were in that group. And I mean, he's had a career that still a lot of people had <laughs> had killed for, wouldn't they? But it's not the career that it, it sort of promised to be. And I think a lot that's quite widely reported is down to application and dedication and things like that. You, you've got to have, you've got to have both if you're going to make it. Yeah, I think maybe outside influence as well. Yeah. You know, he, he's obviously very close with his friends, his family, and and, and maybe just, it, it was a job. Mm. Maybe, yeah. you know, some, there's a lot of football you speak to. It was a job. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I love playing football and, People ask me, do I miss it? I don't. Mi I actually don't miss the play. I, I, I still play vets football, no man's football. Yeah. I don't actually miss it. I was watching a couple of games on Monday, and I was stood there going, God, "Could I be?" It was freezing. It was Baltic, and I'm thinking, I could see some of the youth team players training like in the distance. I'm thinking, could I do that? I don't know if I could be asked to do that anymore. Yeah, I, I enjoy watching football more than I do sort of playing it now. 
Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think the transition when I left, I went into a coaching background for a bit and then I went into scouting and it, I, I possibly went through a transition where I found it difficult without realising whether it was anxiety, whether there was a bit of depression. I don't know. I just, I went through a tough time, but because I didn't know anything about stuff like that, yeah. you just get on with it and you come through it and you think, oh, I was just, I was just moping. I was just sulking, but actually it could have been a little bit of that transition of leaving playing professional football, not knowing what I want to do, being a bit of a part-time coach and then not understanding where I wanted to go to and where I wanted to get to and realising you need qualifications if you want to get a proper job. Because ultimately, this is not a job playing football or, or watching football. It's it's an enjoyment, it's a passion. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, at Forest, she was loaned out to Burnley. How is that for? <laughs> yeah. How is that for a young footballer to sort of go out and get that experience? Um. So, I was nineteen. So I just turned nineteen. End of May. And I think went to Burnley. My first month was. I think it might be November. I did a month in November and then a month in December. Um, so the manager was Jimmy Mullen, who's uh, from the North East, Jimmy. Legend. And how was it? It was strange because it was the old first division, which is the championship. Obviously, Forrest were, were back in the Premier League with Frank Clark. I think he got promoted straight back up again. So it was 90, might be 95, I went, I think. And Frank had said to us, this and go out and get 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 some experience. So I went on loan and played my first game against South End. South End were actually in the sort of like what you class as the old second division championship now. And um, they had some talented players. Chris Powell was playing, who ended up playing for England. And um I've gone to Burnley and you've got um a guy called Ted McMinn played for Derby, they used to call him the Tin Man, yeah. who was a great lad, Scottish guy, um Jamie Hoyland, who played for Sheffield United. Um you had Adrian Heath, who played for Everton. You know, you had some unbelievable talented players who who sort of were playing at the club. And my first game, I'm, I turn up on a Friday, I train, the manager speaks to me on the Saturday before I make my debut. So this is my football league debut. He comes into the dressing room, he says, listen, whatever happens today, this will be the best day of your life. Don't worry about your performance. You'll go out and you'll smash it. Go and enjoy yourself. It's a brilliant. We won 5-1. I got man of the match. I came at the end of the game. He's buzzing. Absolutely brilliant. Never spoke to me for another month. <laughs> God's honest truth, never spoke to me for a month. Did you ever find out why? I'm going to say, from that never debut, spoke, spoke, man of the Jim, match, 5-1. Jimmy never spoke, I... never spoke to anyone. It was... He had, um... he, had a, he had a guy called Clive Middlemass who was brilliant. Clive was top, top guy. I think he was at Preston as well, Clive. And... Um, Clive was brilliant and picked up a few injuries because obviously I was getting used to obviously the the, the pace and stuff. You playing reserve team football was different back in the day. You you still played with first team players and it was a mixture and it was a good league, good standard. You know, you'd go and play at Everton, you'd go and play at, at, at um at sort of Anfield and playing against Neil Ruddick and people like that. So you you play against top players at the time, but you're you're playing in, in front of a crowd, you're playing with the adrenaline, you're playing sort of for points where it actually matters, yeah. you know, and he never spoke to me for a month and then my loan was coming up to be renewed and he pulls me in the office on a Friday. My loan runs out on the Saturday. He's going, oh, you've been magnificent for me. You know, I want you to stay for another month. You've been brilliant. You know, I thought you'd been top of gun. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'll stop for another month. Never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> never spoke to me again. I, I just didn't know whether, whether I was coming or going and I, what I ended up doing, I just said, I think I, I ended up going to, to, to see Frank Clark and said to Frank, like, I wasn't I wasn't enjoying it. I, I didn't, because I was injured as well. I picked up a few injuries and it was frustrating for me. And I sort of had a bit of side problems with my, my hamstring. And so I ended up coming back and it also coincided where they played Liverpool in the FA Cup third round and I wasn't allowed to play it. Mm. I, was, I wasn't allowed to play in it for whatever reason. And I think the first game was postponed because of snow and then they had it seven days later. So I never really played a lot of games. Yeah. But it was a, a great experience, and I still speak to some of the guys that that obviously played at the time. You know, I'd still see them on the circuit. A couple of the boys work for Everton, and um, scouting. So you still see them. It, it met, met some really good people, and listen, it. I think if you speak to anyone, I think being able to be loaned for one month or two months or three months, mm. 
is better than being on for six months or a year. Yeah. Because if it doesn't work out and you've signed a year agreement, there's no get out for both clubs. You're at a football club where you, you, you're you not playing and you can be frustrated. Where there it was a bit easier. If they didn't want you, they could send you back. And if you didn't want to stay, you could go back. Yeah. So I, I think that helped me because obviously the year after I went on another loan and a couple of loans and so I ended up having four loans before I actually played in Nottingham Forest first team. Yeah. The, the time you were at Burnley as well, uh, I'm a Burnley fan, if that weren't clear. Well, I went like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was a weird time that we just got promoted to what's now the championship. We actually got relegated that season because um, we, we didn't have the squad for it, unfortunately, uh, it turned out. But yeah, it, it were getting a bit... <laughs> there's been a lot of rumours about Jimmy that season, Jimmy Mullen, but he, 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 were, get, he were under pressure from fans and there's yeah. a really well-known story around Christmas of the, that season. In the it, chip it, shop, was that? The chip shop, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I've told just yeah. Josh and Nick about that before, but yeah, some dickhead tried to set his wife on fire in a chip shop and that's that's God's honest truth but that's some some of our fan base up sadly um, but yeah it's an interesting time that you were there some, like you said we did have a good squad I think was that like Andy Cook Kurt Nolan, uh, Andy uh, Cook was there uh, and obviously John Mullins was coming through Brassy was coming through yeah yeah obviously um, you had Andy Savile signed you had Big John Gale who came in Big John Gale and, yeah um, <laughs> Yeah, Paul Stewart came on loan as well yeah. from Liverpool. When he just been between sort of these, re, listen, it was a, it was to be around. I mean, like Paul, I watched Paul Stewart score the winner against Forest. Yeah, a couple hours at the game with Forest, and I'm playing in the same team with him. When when you sort of, it was a great experience. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna laugh at this. So I, I actually see Jimmy around because Jimmy does a bit of scouting for Millwall. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. And then when I finished my career, I went and played for Hucknall Town. Des Little, who played for Forest, was manager of Hucknall Town. So I said, yeah, I'll go and play a bit of football for you. So I live in Nottingham. So it was only up the road. And we were playing against um, Mark at Drayton, which is obviously a team in Stoke. And um, this, I was playing left back and the pitch is crap, floodlights are crap. And this lad was giving, this manager was giving us a bit of jib on the bench. And I basically told him to F off. <laughs> Give it all that. And the next, like, so I've told him where to go and told him to go and swivel and, and not call them a knobhead and everything. And literally, after I finished calling him a knobhead, I goes, all right, Jimmy, how are you doing? He's going, all right, Craig, how are you? And then I started having a conversation. The game's going on and I've not even took the throw in. It was so surreal. But every time I see him, catch up with him, and I used to say to him, Jimmy, can you remember when you brought me on loan? You never spoke to me for a month. Honestly, it, but you, you laugh about it now. And, and maybe he might have done things differently, but listen, he was going through a, a probably a tough time. Obviously, there was, there was talk around his his health and stuff like that. Mm. And then obviously, what had happened with his wife? It just. But you see him now, and he's such a lovely, lovely guy. What a top, top guy! Well, he's absolutely loved by Burnley fans. There's been a campaign to get him back at do half time draw for years. Cause he's always he left under a cloud, and then there's always been this belief he just doesn't want anything to do with a club, because which is understandable with what happened. But uh, yeah. if you know Jimmy and you see him, Craig, tell him, Burnley fans do love him. him. I definitely will. And they, and they want him back at half time to give him a clap that he deserves. Not that we can do it at the minute. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about it. So, yeah. from Nottingham Forest, you did join Huddersfield Town for, I, think, I yeah. believe it was about 750k, which is quite a large fee at the time. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll tell you. <laughs> How is that for, for for you? And was there any added pressure on, obviously, with such a, a, a fee around it? Um, not so much. I mean, again, so Ron Atkinson. I, I, so I started the Premier League season when we got promoted. Um, obviously, that was the season Van Hoydonk had gone on strike. They saw um, Kevin Kevin Campbell to tra- Trailsborg, and um, obviously, I, ro- I used to room with Stevie Guinan when we were in the Championship and. It was it, it was it was strange because they got rid of Harry Bassett and Ron came in and and obviously I played the first game I played the first three or four games Ron came in and then he said listen you know I, we've had we've had a bid from from Huddersfield and listen you don't have to go if you don't want to go you know you've got eighteen months left on your contract and um, but I've been promised the money and I always said to myself if anyone ever came in and offered uh, money for me and the club accepted the bid. I always said that I would leave. Now, I spoke to Mickey Adams at the time, who was obviously reserve team manager around the first team as well. And Mickey said, listen, Ron's not going to be at the end of the season, stick it out. 
you know, you don't have to go. It's a good club. You, you're part of a good club. You'll get back in type thing. So I knew I was going to play for the rest of the season. And I was going to be in and out. But as it happened, Marcus Stewart was at Huddersfield. Yeah. And I was on loan with Stewie at, at Bristol Rovers when Marcus was a player. And I actually knew Huddersfield had bid 750 three weeks before I actually went because I had a phone call from Peter Jackson asking me would I be interested in coming to, to Huddersfield. Yeah. He said, I don't know anything about it, Jacko. He said, oh, we'll put a bid in for you. I said, well, as soon as they tell me, then we'll have a conversation. Mm. So it wasn't until three weeks later I was told that they'd put a bid in for me. But I'd sort of in my own head, I'd sort of a- agreed, I think, that I, that I would go if I could get the right sort of contract and, and make it right for yeah. me. I wanted to go. I wanted to try and try something new. I've got relatives, relatives living in Huddersfield, like my mum's sisters and my cousins are all there. And, you know, I'm not saying that's the best thing to go away with where family is, but I knew people. Dave Phillips was at the club, so Dave Phillips had gone from from Forest. So I don't think the fee was a big thing. Mm, you know, yeah. let me just get in there. It was meant to be a million, but um, the, just before I, just before I signed for the club, Huddersfield said they weren't going to pay the other three hundred grand on appearances. So I think Forest wanted the money, yeah. and I think it wasn't to give to Ron. I think they ended up not giving him a penny of the money. So I think it was just they were struggling financially. Yeah. Um, do you know what? What an absolute fantastic club. You know, I didn't. I never wanted to leave the football club. Um, they went through a tough time. Obviously, when they got relegated, the, the chairman took over. They didn't have the money to, to sort of support it. Um, when Barry Ruby obviously had come in and took over the club, um, the season after, I'd, obviously, I'd signed in the February. Then Steve um, Peter Jackson got sacked. Barry Ruby bought the club, bought Steve Bruce in, and I think things just changed. And it was a good club real good club um, they wanted to try they had ambitions to get promoted they spent money brought George Donis in from Blackburn bought Christopher Kenny in from Bury and um, you know they spent money yeah. uh, Dean Gorey from yeah. Ajax Kenny Irons from Trammy who was an outstanding player Scott Sellers top top players you know, you got, you know, Ken Moncal from, from from Southampton who yeah. you know they brought in a good good squad and as it happened they all the boys they, put, they brought in ended up being injured. So we got to top of the league by sort of Christmas and it was basically around, there was only two players that Steve Bruce had brought in actually were were fit, who were playing because he had a habit of hammering all the boys that he didn't bring in and it had to be it had to be sort of highlighted by the physio at the time. You are aware that all these boys that you brought in aren't even fit. The boys are here before, the lads have got you to the top of the league. So, yeah. but listen, it was it was just a good club, family club. Um, again, another type of club. If you if you run around for the for the fans, whether you play crap or not, that they they respected you. Yeah, they they, they knew when you didn't put this. Whether it's just a a bit like the Burnley fans, a bit like the sort of Sheffield United fans. If you show passion and commitment that you want to run around, they can accept a bad a bad performance. Yeah, absolutely true. That yeah, yeah, hundred percent. That's that's what a lot of fans base it on, isn't it? They want to see a player who's working hard, trying his best. And yeah, I think sometimes if the best on that day ain't good enough, they're willing to let it ride rather than someone who's got all the talent and they just yeah. <laughs> don't look arsed. You're looking at United with Pogba. And I know it's harsh at the minute because he's playing well, but yeah, um, McTominay is a good player, but he's probably not got a 10 for this talent. Yeah. But- the difference with them two playing together is doesn't matter. You, you know you'll get a shift out of McTominay. Pogba, it's up in the air, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. That's all you ask for as a player. At the end of the day, there's been players for Burnley who've not had the most talent, um, but I've loved them because you can see them busting a gut. Like one of my favourite ever players for Burnley was Dean Marnie. Yeah. yeah. Probably League One standard, arguably, in terms of actual ability on the ball, but top <laughs> Champions League standard for running his bollocks off every week and that's all you ask for that's all we'd want to do if we were footballers isn't it so absolutely 100% so you've actually played alongside one of the guests that we've had on so Ben Thornley how was he like to play with obviously being quoted one of the best players since George Best what was he like obviously I know he'd just come back from them injuries and whatnot but as a player what was he like do you know what what a top lad Ben is? Um, I've I've obviously bummed into him a few times at games because he does Man United TV, yeah. And, and I've played a couple of sort of charity sort of events with him, and um, 
he's so he's life and soul of everything. He's so outgoing, and I, you know, I saw Ben as a Ben Thorny, what I thought was a talented player. I never saw the Ben Thorny that everyone talks about being unbelievable. Mm, yeah, that, that injury he had wrecked his career, re- wrecked what his potential could have been. Yeah, I was never privy because back in them days when when you sort of you played your league systems, you've got your category ones and category twos now. Not even Forest would play against an Aston Villa, a West Brom, a Walsall, a Mansfield, a Notts County, where where Man, Man United would play Everton, Liverpool, Burnley, Bury, Rochdale. So I never got to see, other than maybe a pre-season game, what talent he was. But totally naturally gifted off both feet, could go either way. Probably came to Huddersfield and probably didn't live right. He'd probably be the first one to tell you that. He, he, I think it, it mentally scarred him what had happened. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's got to when you've spoken in that such calibre of, of players that he's played with where he spe- spoke about being better than any of them Yeah. Mm-hmm. so then come to a Huddersfield no disrespect to Huddersfield to come to Huddersfield and then sort of try and rebuild a career and then he went to Aberdeen and, and, and he had a couple of years up there and I just don't think it worked for him I just think it was too much for him to travelling and yeah. going through what, whether it was a, a, a new relationship or an old one or and I just think it killed him but the boy had a lot of ability yeah. quick I mean, he was quick, but you don't realise how much how quick he was yeah. before his injury. Yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah. listen, good, good guy. Very open and honest. That say saying what you've said, really, that absolutely it did ruin his career. He did still go on and, and rebuild a career, but yeah, it's it's a shame, and it, it would be great to to turn back time if possible and just see how how good he could have been. Yeah, I mean, he's had the mental strength to do it. Yeah, but the injury obviously ruined him and killed him, and maybe still could have had a long, long career. But maybe that just affected him a little bit more. And again, if we talk about what support was there for him, yeah, if he'd had the support players or or people are getting now, then you could have still had a, a very, very talented player. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with with that season, I think it was a. 98, 99, or potentially 99, 2000 season, Craig, you had at Huddersfield. You did come, you had, like you say, a really good squad, and Clyde Weinard was always one. Now. Yeah, so that would have been, so the 98, 99, so I joined in February of 99, mm. and then, yeah. then Steve Bruce came in the, the, the 2000, 2001 season. Right. So it would have been, so we, we were top of the league, um, Clyde Weinard, Marcus Stewart up front, Great pair of that. Kenny Irons in, in midfield. You had Chris Lachetti, Kev Gray, John Dyson at the back. Myself, um, Jamie Vincent either played left back or I played centre back. Um, Kevin Gray, who had been there, stalwart, who used to be at Mansfield, who was, who was Ben's best mate. Steve Jenkins, who played for Wales. Mm. Um, I don't think we were like a star studded side, but the worked. I mean, listen, Kenny Irons, for me, it was unbelievable it, it just not healthy not a healthy person like the pint um, like <laughs> 10 pints on a Saturday come in Monday train like anyone else and, but as a footballer wow unbelievable on the ball mm. ridiculous never gave the ball away and you had like Scott Sellers who'd come in and Clyde up front Clyde and Stewie up front were, were very very good yeah. Clyde Clyde Clyde's, Clyde's a good lad I, I mean I see Clyde quite a lot and Lads used to call him Clive, didn't used to call him Clyde, so I don't really <laughs> like that. And uh, they used to call him sometimes Wide Yard instead of Wine Yard, because he always used to miss the target. <laughs> I think we played, uh, played Liverpool in the FA Cup. Um, I played centre-back with um, Kevin Gray, and I think Ben played wide left, and Stephen Gerrard was playing right back at the time. And we battered Liverpool on TV. We battered them first half. And I think it was TT Kamara scored sort of an overhead kick and... Um, I think it was Dom- Dominic Matteo went through second half to score the, the second, but Clyde missed eight nine chances, real good chances. And if they'd if they'd fallen to Stewie, we would have won that game. There would have been a massive upset. Yeah. And you know, I mean, we we were a good side, and mm. we just 
we just couldn't get over the we couldn't get over the final fence when so we I think we were in the top six. We, so at Boxing Day we play Charlton Boxing Day. I think we're top there second, and we get beat three one. I think it was three one. I can't remember. I got knocked out just before half time, so I came off at half time. But we got beat, and then we sort of we fluttered and flitted and, and didn't perform well enough that season. And we came the last game of the season against Fulham, and we needed to win to get in the playoffs. And we got took we got beat three nil. Um, I was injured. I had a problem again with my arms. I was having problems with my calves, and got beat three nil, and got beat comfortably three nil, and we missed out. And yes, it was a good season, but you know, looking back now, it was a disappointing season because we should have made the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. what you've just said there is almost a carbon copy of one of my favourite ever seasons as a Burnley fan. I don't know why it is because, like you say, event very sim- so similar to what you've just said. But I still really, it's a, a failure. But we were top at Christmas. And second was Kevin Keegan's Man City. Mm. And we played them on Boxing Day and at Main Road, as it was, got absolutely twatted 5 1. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the last day of the season, I mean, we were like eight points clear at Christmas. Um, on the last day of the season, we had to beat Norwich by two goals to get, uh, beat Coventry by two goals mm. to get in the playoffs. And then we didn't even get in the playoffs. <laughs> it's, and it's very similar to what you've just said there. Do you think it was the psychological effect of Charlton beating you then that kind of drew, made your second half of the season so much worse, do you think? I don't know. I, I mean, you, this sounds silly, like, because of stuff like that's highlighted so much more now in the game with the analysts, you know, um, Carragher and Neville and how they'll say things affect you. I don't look back at that and think, we got beat off Charlton, that's why we, we didn't make the playoffs. I just, I just think, did, didn't we... Then we said, I can't remember if we sold Marcus Stewart or if that was the year after we sold Stewie. So I think we sold Marcus the year after, but I just think it was just, it just didn't work out. It just didn't happen. Um, we sort of struggled. I'll have to look at that. I don't know if it was Stewie was sold then or I even think Marcus might have been sold by the end of the season where I think Clyde only ended up scoring one goal in 15 games, if, that, if I'm right. Because I think yeah, I think that I think we saw you might be able to tell us now if you're on the internet. I think Who's we saw Stewie, I think we saw Stewie and to, to Ipswich because I don't think Steve believed he was good enough to play in the Premier League. And I think we sold him in the February. And I don't think Clyde scored another goal. I think the only goal he scored was away at Charlton, where we won one nil. And I think we got battered for 89 minutes of the game against Charlton at Charlton and we won one nil. Yeah, he was controversially sold. Uh, it was 2001, wasn't it? At 99-2000, the running, apparently, towards the end of the season, the final. Yeah, it would have been the end of, end of the season. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been the 2001 season, so it would have been, two, that's wrong, but 2000, yeah. yeah. So, so, Steve sold him. And now, w- w- one thing about Stewie is that he, he would go through a stage where he might not score for eight goals, eight mm-hmm. games, sorry, yeah. 10 games. Well, guaranteed, he'd, he'd finish with 25, 30 goals a season because he'd go and score. 15 goals in eight games. Yeah. He was, he, he is one of the best. It's not played with some good strikers, but this he's a, he's a good friend of mine. And, and I, I, I still think to this day, he was one of the best strikers I've ever played with because yeah. was never the quickest, but he was so comfortable on the ball. Really? Lovely feel, lovely left foot and could finish. Could Didn't score goals. Friends. Didn't he? Did he? Did he? Did he? Ipswich, was it? Yeah. It was it was it, you were always a quality player, I thought. Yeah. Well, well we, we ended up, funny enough, we ended up playing Ipswich that season and he hadn't scored when he went to Ipswich. Again, Shuey maybe not not living right at the time when he went down new, new environment. And I think he scored his first goal against us and they beat us 2-0. Yeah. And we, we played all right that day, but they, they beat us 2-0. They had him and Dave Johnson up front. So they were good and James Scorecroft was playing and Jim Jilton, I think, was there as well. I think... So they weren't bad, and he ended up going and scoring the, uh, a goal in the final, and they got promoted. Yeah, yeah. It's about, if you're going to talk about why we didn't go, I think that's why we didn't get promoted because yeah. we sold a partnership that was working. Yeah, yeah. Maybe at the time, two point three million rising to three was a that maybe Steve thought that was a real good money at the time, and probably was back then. Yeah, I would have been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so moving on a little bit then. So from Huddersfield, you did join Sheffield Wednesday. Now, I believe that season they finished 22nd, which 
ultimately got them relegated. But they had some class players in that team, such as Kevin Pressman, Grant Hall, Lloyd Arusa, who's actually coming on our podcast in the next week or two. Mm. What is that like for a team sort of getting relegated and the morale sort of in that squad to rebuild the next season? So, so as it happened, so I joined in the in the 2000 and what, um, 2002 Chef, Sheffield Wednesday, February. Um, I always seem to have a three-year stint at clubs, so I joined in 2002 and we stayed up that season with Terry Yorath and then halfway through the season or three months into the season, he, re- he resigned mm. and Chris Turner came in and I don't think Chris could keep us up. We just we just didn't have the the know-how. Again, I was the, the issues I was having at Huddersfield with my calves, I ended up having similar problems at Huddersfield, um, Sheffield Wednesday for a little bit and then we got relegated and I had two years left on my contract and it just didn't work out for me where I think Chris Turner wanted to bring fresh people in. The chairman wanted me out of the club. We were talking about getting the wage bill down and all the guys that were there that were probably on decent money, the Shevsky Coochies and, yeah. and and Paul McLaren yeah. and people like that, only had a year left. So they were easier to move on at the end of the season than me. So I sort of flitted in and out the season that year, went along to Grimsby and that was obviously the season we got relegated when we were trying to get promoted again. Um, no, in fact, that was the season we we got relegated. So it was it was a strange one, really. I think it was it was it was a it was a club in transition. I mean, again, you're right. Yeah. So I went there when Simon Donnelly was there and Phil O'Donnell, and um, you had um, John Harks. They're not John Harks. Um, Steve Harkness from Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, Gerald C. Bond was there. Andy Hinchcliffe was still there when I joined the club. Danny Maddox, who was at QPR, they had an unbelievable squad. Mm. Real good squad. And, um, you know, again, another club in transition, paying possibly too much money to like the likes of Sabon and um, Simon Donnelly for the league we were in, which wasn't their fault. But I think that just had a, a backlash on the chairman and the chairman then sort of wanted to move people on and get people out. And I think... It's such a fantastic club and again, another working class city. Yeah. Fans who pay a lot of money to go and watch rubbish football at the moment and, <laughs> and, and being dealt a bit of a rough blow by the, by the owner of the football club. And they're a club like that have a fan base. If they're in the Premier League, we'll just take off. Yeah. yeah. Really take off. They've, they've had, certainly had a crap 20 years, haven't they, Wednesday? You know, yeah. if, if ever there's a club, you know, I, I look from sort of championship downwards that's really is a sleeping giant. You know, it, it, it's Wednesday. You just have to wonder with clubs that get taken over and it, you look, I mean, I know they've had takeovers and that's part of the problem. They've not gone well, but someone somewhere has got to be looking at Wednesday and thinking, if you do that club right, you're sitting on a gold mine. That is a, a, certainly a Premier League club. The yeah. thing is though, the, the owner of the football club, is very, very, very wealthy. Mm. Very wealthy. I mean, he, he he's that wealthy. He realised that the kit sponsor, who it was a couple of years ago, he thought, well, we get like 40, 50,000 fans and people buying shirts. Mm. I'll just set up my own kit company and I'll, be, I'll make my own kits. And that's what he did. Yeah. He, he owns, he owns, is it John West Fishery? Oh, so, really? Yeah, so every time he, I eat tuna mayonnaise, I'm, eat, I'm eating a pizza <laughs> on Wednesday. I have no idea. He is a very wealthy man, but he's he's a businessman. Yeah, mm. and that's the problem. Like a lot of these clubs have businessmen, and, and ultimately they want to they want to make money, don't they? And yeah, and you can't keep you can't keep paying salaries to get yourself out of a league that everyone else is doing the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not a it's not a business model for making money I don't think going in a football club is it but no yeah, yeah. Mel Morris <laughs> <laughs> and, and again if, if they get took over you know they're, they're reported to be worth sort of billions yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, Nick is waiting with bated breath for that <laughs> <laughs> I am I'm desperate for Darby to have some money not even just <laughs> not even just a take over just some money <laughs> But, uh, so, so Darby, again, I mean, one thing about Derby is that for for a, a small city, town, or however you want to do it, they fill the stand, they fill the ground. Where yeah. where Forest of late 
have done better with it, but they've not they went through a stage where they weren't filling the ground. And yet, I hate to say it, Forest is a bigger club than Derby. I'm and leaving. Like, Cinebet, guys. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but Derby fans flood flood the ground and fill it. You know, you, you on average, you, you were averaging twenty eight to 30,000 fans yeah. you know, in the Championship, which is a phenomenal, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, again, a team in transition, aren't we? We put so much effort into our youth system. I mean, you look at our first first 11, including bench, you've got at least 10 academy players in that team. So, it's I suppose it's credit to what they've done. But it's credit to the work that the recruitment team, um, who, who the, the Chris Perkins, who headed up the recruitment, who's now moved to, to Everton, um, which is obviously a big loss for... For Derby, yeah. but good for him. But yeah, it, it shows what, and not just him, also the guys who are on the ground, on the grass, getting the boys out of grassroots football. The guys that are in Nottingham robbing the place from Nottingham, <laughs> bringing the boys over from 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 Nottingham City yeah. Centre, and so just stay in your own patch, just stay in your own place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So. Uh... So moving on again, a little bit further into your career and uh, with Cheltenham Town, who's a massive part of sort of our podcast, really, because we've got a good little relationship with them as well. But how was your time with Cheltenham? Obviously, I think you was previously with Grimsby Town. But how was your time at Cheltenham? Yeah, so if you look at my Wikipedia, it, it, it doesn't read very well because it talks that I, I took a year out of the game where I didn't. So when I when I left Sheffield Wednesday, I went to Bradford for, for six months. Colin Todd was manager. Um, yeah. Colin Todd of a youth team manager was totally different to a Colin Todd of a first team manager. So we had, we had a bit of a fallout, to be fair. Right. And, um, you know, it, it always happens. And then I left Bradford and I'd been on loan at Grimsley while I was at Wednesday and went back to, to Sheffield Wednesday and then obviously with Paul Sturrock and then eventually went to Bradford. And what had happened is I was... I wanted to move back home. I was sick of travelling and I'd been offered a contract at Knox County. So I was training with Knox County pre-season. But in the meantime, I'd been down to Cheltenham and, and I met up with John Ward and Keith Downing, who's Keith's now obviously one of the first team coaches of Bristol City with Paul Simpson and met up with him and they wanted to bring Mickey Bell in from Bristol City. And Cheltenham are not a big, big paying club. And I think Mickey had a better offer on the table from Port Vale. And I was training with Knox County and John had offered me a contract, a two-year deal at, at Cheltenham and Notts County had offered me a one-year deal. And I wanted to stay at home because I, I had a young family and um, obviously I was married and I was sick of travelling and yes. something happened at Notts County where they just changed the whole terms of the contract and it was it was a bit sort of disrespectful how they dealt with it. It wasn't the manager's fault and it was the, the owner of the club and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go to Cheltenham. So I, I went to Cheltenham on, on a pittance. Do you know what? What a fantastic club. Again, like a Bristol Rovers, a family club, like a, a Huddersfield, a family club, where you really made it feel welcome and, and warm. Not a lot of people, not a lot of staff there. John Ward, I knew because he, he took me on loan to Bristol Rovers. Um, Steve Guinan was there that I played a group in the youth team with at Forest and John Finnegan, the captain, we grew up in the same youth team. So to sort of, I, I thought that would be my last club and I think I might have gone to the five in after that, but I thought that was going to be my last club. And, and to finish sort of my, start my career with, with Finners and Gins and sort of end my career with both of them at the same club for two years, I thought was, was, was brilliant. You know, yeah. got promoted um, on a shoestring, managed to stay up in the first division on a limited budget again. Um, we used the loan market quite well. And then, I had a sort of a contract wrangle with John Ward at the end of that season where he want, he, I wanted a two-year deal and he wanted to offer me a one-year deal and um, I decided to go to Gillingham, mm. which was the yeah. biggest mistake of my life. Mm. You know, it wasn't the club. It was just, it was too far away. I'd been, I'd been on loan to Gillingham as a young kid and with, with um, Tony Pulis and, and I didn't enjoy being that far away from home and, I just didn't, I didn't feel, I didn't like the feel of it. The club's a brilliant club, by the way, you know, great people. But I just, it just didn't fit me and, and I probably didn't play well enough when I went back and um, Paul Stimson came in and he want, he had his own ideas. He wanted to bring in everyone from Stevenage or from non-league and we were League One. 
Um, which, by the way, I don't have a problem with that. And I just said to, to Paul, listen, if, you, if I'm not for you, mm. I, you know, I'll, I'll gladly leave. I, I, you know, I've got a young family. It's not about the money. And, um, you know, without going into too much detail, we had a massive fallout and um, I left the cloud and a bit of a cloud of smoke with him. He, they paid me up and I did an interview with Gloucestershire paper and Cheltenham were playing Gillingham at Gillingham on that Saturday and I'd left on the Tuesday and I'd already agreed to go back to Cheltenham. <laughs> but I was going to the game that day and I got a phone call from Paul Stimson saying... Um, Basically, rang me four times from withheld numbers, and then I got a phone call from Delroy Facey saying, "And I was at Huddersfield with Del." He says, "Craig, don't come to the game. Stimmel wants to kill you." He goes, "What are you on about?" <laughs> so what he'd done is this article I'd done. He'd put up on the wall in the dressing room. No. He said, "This is what your teammate has said about you guys." <laughs> now, what I'd said was, I'd gone to the hotel on the Thursday night, on the Friday night before they played on the Saturday. I'm joining Cheltenham on the Monday. <laughs> no one knows I'm joining Cheltenham. And I've and, and I got asked on the Thursday interview, you know, you, your old sides playing um against obviously Cheltenham, your new side playing against Cheltenham, you know, what how do you think it's gonna go? And say, so, Oh, I've left the club. And they didn't know and say, so, Oh, well, why? Because oh, it was just a mutual thing, you know, I wasn't enjoying it and you know, I've got something else I'm gonna to go to. And I didn't tell them where I was going, and they asked me a question. So then you know, what do you think the result will be? Who do you want to win? And I, what am I going to say? I want Cheltenham to win, don't I? He says, I hope Cheltenham absolutely stuffed them. <laughs> and, and then they went on about, you know, how, how things had worked out. And I said, listen, I said, Paul Sturrock was a really, really good sort of coach, fantastic coach, great trainer, loved his sessions. But he was the worst man manager I've ever played for. Couldn't manage people, managed international people, treat, treat them really poorly. Um were a really good coach. And what he did is he put on this article how I'd sort of wanted Cheltenham to win and I wanted Gillian to get beat. And it was like a lot of negatives. But he managed to leave off on the article that I'd said he was the worst man manager I've ever played. <laughs> and, and he brought in a guy called John Nutter who actually was a very, very good player. And, and I wish John all the best. You know, you know that's, that's for him. I was more than happy with that. Yeah. But they didn't know I was going to Cheltenham. <laughs> so, so as it happened... And again, a little story. I, I went to Cheltenham and, and we stayed up mm. and Gillingham got relegated. <laughs> and, and, and Stimmel had a, yeah, a right. sort of a habit of, of sort of like Nicky Southall, who's experienced player, top, top talent. Gillingham through and through was player of the month for two months on the trot. Then he'd leave him out for a game. Someone else would come in and do well. Then he'd loan him out to Dover for a month. And then bring him back into League One and play him again. He was up and down. So I um, I was annoyed with Stimmel because obviously of what had happened. So I went out on a night out in in, um, in Bristol with a few cricketers who played for Gloucester Cricket and a couple of lads who played for New Zealand. And we're on a night out and we'd just beaten, I think we'd just beaten someone 1-0 and they got beat off crew 3-0. So I'd had a drink and I decided that I'd text him in the nightclub. So I text him saying, you're a good manager, aren't you? And he... Uh, <laughs> and and this he, is after the relegation, is it? No, I hadn't been relegated yet. All oh, right, OK. I said, I just said, you're a good manager, aren't you? And, and, and I put, wah, like... <laughs> and then... Um, I'm in the bar, there was no reception in the bar and it kept flittering and out and, and I had a couple of missed calls on my phone. Oh, that's a miss. It was withheld. So I got outside the club and I'm with Seamus McDonough who played for Gloucester and a lad called Steve Kirby who, who played for Gloucester who... who cricket coach at Derby now and we'd had a few drinks and I, and I listened to a couple of messages on my phone there's a message from Paul Stimson basically threatening to kill me and <laughs> like, when I see you you're a dead man and all that and again you're yeah, a bit dust bit, bit bit sort of drunk and got a bit irate so Hamish, Hamish Marshall rings him he doesn't pick up and said like who are you who do you think you are and so Hamish has left a, a voicemail down the phone and I've just lost my head, Anna. So I'm thinking I'm going to get him back. So I've gone to a hotel where I'm stopping and I've rang him. And he's not picked up and I've just give it like, who are you? Paul Stimson. He says, League One manager, League Two manager. He says, you're not even a pub manager. You're not even good enough to manage the Red Lion. And then I hung up on him. So obviously next day I wake up and, and it's one of them going, 
oh, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? And I, I get a voice, uh, a phone call from, from him trying to ring me. So I'm thinking, how do I get out? I don't want to speak to him. I can't, like, and I'm thinking, so I just thought, says, Stimo, listen, um, you've said some things and I've said some things. My phone call last night was a reaction to your voicemails. Um, I just said someone banded my phone. Someone got my phone and banded you and I didn't realise until you'd sent me the message. It was me who'd done it, but I just thought yeah. I could have that. So, <laughs> so talk about karma. <laughs> I'm leaving Chelmsford with Martin Allen. I'm going to Burton on loan with, with Nigel Clough. Yeah. And then um, Cheltenham are playing... Um, I think it's Port, um, a plane Gillingham in the FA Youth Cup and I had a really good relationship with Martin Allen I wasn't for him he, he wanted to move me on but he was fine with me but I, I still don't know whether it was because maybe Paul Stimson played with him at a couple of clubs and they had a relationship and yeah. and he told them that he didn't like me and all that but so I'm in the boardroom and Paul Stimson's son plays for Gillingham right so I'm in the boardroom and I'm talking to like a couple of guys and it was chocker and, and who walks up the stairs? Paul Simpson. <laughs> and he, he walks up the stairs and he, he walks past me, grabs me around the neck and he says, you ever, ever ring me again, <laughs> I'll break your fucking legs. Right? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, all right. And I'm, I'm stuck with Ian Wong, who I played with the Forest. He was at Portsmouth. They had him in the next round. He goes, have I just heard right? <laughs> come back to me and he says, I'm telling you, you ever ring me again, I'll kill you. <laughs> right? Now, my only regret was that I didn't turn around and say to him, Simo, I'll give you a ring later. That's all <laughs> I didn't say to him. But listen, right, can we get Paul to ring him right oh, now? It would be funny if I done it. Ring him now. Him now. <laughs> I, I look, I listen, I look back at it, and, um, <laughs> and I think, like, listen, he was, a, he was a fantastic coach, and what he did at Stevenage was phenomenal. And, yeah. again, difficult club to manage sometimes at, at Gillingham with, you know, Paul Scully, really fantastic chairman, puts his money in and sometimes if you're not having success, he moves people on and I just think it was a difficult time but I still stand by it. I think he could have managed me better than what he did. You know, I was a senior pro, pro, pro. I wasn't a, someone who just played non-league and all that. He, he, I'm an honest person. If he just said this and you're not for me, I'd have gone, not a problem. I'll find yeah. myself a club. I was yeah. more than happy to do that. So, strange times when you go to gym. So, I ended up going back to Cheltenham and, and obviously, again, we spoke about just a, a great club and um, just a shame that they got rid, rid of Keith Downing too soon. I felt it was far too soon for him. They needed one more player. We brought Lloyd Russo in, um, who I'd played with at Sheffield Wednesday and, and I think we just needed one more acquisition to the side. I think Keith would have been fine and, and I just think that the board acted too hastily, brought Martin in and, and listen, the club just went on a demise. Again, yeah. Martin being a little bit off the wall at times and um, chairman gave him everything he wanted and I just think it just didn't, they didn't have the finances to do it. And that's not Martin's fault and it's not the chairman's fault. I just think that they, it just didn't work out and it's just a shame. Yeah. And Martin Allen seems like he's done great at some clubs. And then, I mean, we were from Chesterfield, Craig. Mm. So yeah. He had a really bad time here. Yeah. Weird how some managers just fit certain clubs, isn't it? You think how good a job he did it. Was he, was he at Brentford? Am I yeah, that? he was. Fantastic. Listen, great Lloyd Russo loves him. Lloyd loves him. Yeah. Do you know what? I, I wasn't for him and probably not my type of manager but he was he, he treated me well he, he like never that. and that's all I ever wanted you know as long as he, he said listen you, as long as you run around and you work hard for me in training I don't have a problem I say I'll take that all day long yeah, yeah. You know? is Martin Allen the one who uh, he wanted everyone to call him Mad Dog and uh, yeah that's him yeah he, used to want I mean, to run listen, he, he had some strange, strange team talks um I mean, we we played um, we we played Tramir away in the, in the in the league, and he he brought six or seven lads in on loan. He can only play five on loan. So we had Scott Murray from from um, Bristol City and a few other boys from Bristol City, and he's pulled me on the bus and he said, "We're stopping in a hotel for a sleep in the afternoon." He's put, so we left early. He pulled me pulled me on the bus. Said, "Listen, you're not involved tonight. I want you to take the guys who aren't involved." Uh, and just do a session with him in the gym. You're in charge. I want you just to sort of be my right hand man. And he was really good at that. To be fair, he, he, he sort of he didn't involve you and then involved you. Mm, so yeah. I was knackered as well. So went in the gym and did a bit in the gym and didn't really put it in. I thought, what's the point? And 
he pulled me. We, we we go we, we turn up at the sort of on the team bus and he walks down the bus and he said, "Did you do a lot in the gym?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, no. Did you do a lot in the gym?" Well, I, I did did enough. He goes, oh, "How are you feeling?" Because I'm all right. Because good, you're on the bench. <laughs> so so he had a habit of doing that. So lads would be able to rest and recover where I wasn't resting and recovering. Yeah. But but his but his team talk in the afternoon. So they had a garden in the hotel. And you had like these big sort of bifolding doors that led into the garden, and there wasn't a lot of space. Maybe only twenty meters from sort of the bifolding doors to the to the conifer trees. Put two posts up, same distance as the goal. And he's doing set play, plays and walking through set plays, and he's having the lads like sort of just deliver the ball or cross the ball at the box and running in, and he'd be going mad at you if if like you weren't running in at pace. And then he said, right. It's an attacking corner. I want two at the back. And so you'd be stood in the in the doorway. So sort of like the canteen or the, the rest, restaurant. Yeah. And he'd say to the guys, like, so I want you on the halfway line. Go on then, on, on the halfway line. So you can imagine what's happening. The lads are like walking into the restaurant. I've asked you to go on the halfway line. <laughs> and so the lads are walking like 20, 30 metres into the sort of the hotel lobby. <laughs> and they're actually, you can't even see the set plays. You can't even see them. They're literally in the kitchen <laughs> to, to do the set plays. And then he's got a lad called Lee Ridley, who we brought in from Scunny. Ridder's a good lad. And, and Rid, Ridder's, Ridder's a, he's, he's, um, he's right-handed, left-footed. Right. Okay. And, and imagine in the garden, I'm trying to paint a picture. So if I'm the halfway line and there's the goal, yeah. there was a wall here that went round here and there was a swimming pool. So the lads were taking corners from round the corner. So anyone stood here couldn't see them taking a corner. And then he'd say, right, there's a free kick outside the box. So he'd put the ball down right next to the wall. So Ridders would be stood taking a in uh, in a, uh, like an in-swing and free kick. And he'd say, take the ball back. It's just like, Gaffer, there's no room. Just take the ball back. So the ball would literally be stood up against the wall, right? And Ridders would be sort of stood. And you imagine like, trying to get your foot to cross it. You can't. And he'd be saying, put the ball in then. Put the ball in. <laughs> all Ridders would do was just sort of wrap his foot where you'd have like three touches to scoop the ball into the box. And then if anyone wasn't running properly at pace, he'd go mad at them. Mad at you. for not doing it. So he was, he was just off the wall. Yeah. I mean, I, I have got one more that I think you would love. And, and I know a few lads. Are, so they did a team talk in a, in a, so when you do a pre-match meal, I wasn't at the club. I think I'd left and gone to Burton. But the yeah. lads were telling me about this. This is how crazy he is. So he's having Ridders doing in-swinging corners, right? But he wanted to take him from both sides. <laughs> and they were in a restaurant and he's moved all the tables out of the way. So it was just a room. However a room is, 20 metres by 20 metres, just a yeah. small room, food comes in, moves everything out of the way. <laughs> he says, right, we're going to set them to do our set plays. And there's no, there's no football in there, but he wants them to use something to throw in. And there's a basket of toast. <laughs> so he gets, he asks Ridders to put some in swinging corners in. And obviously he's right-handed, but left footed. Right. So you can imagine taking a corner from our right-hand side, the opposition's left. And he's thrown a ball in with his like right hand because he's yeah. right-handed. <laughs> and Martin Allen's going, "What are you doing?" I'm putting the corner in. I want in swingers, in swingers. <laughs> I'm right-handed. I want in swingers. So Ridders, you, listen. You can imagine trying to throw a ball when you you can't throw with your non-throwing hand. <laughs> he's apparently throwing the toast in with his left hand. He can't throw it. <laughs> <laughs> So whether Martin was a fit or not, I don't know, but <laughs> you can imagine. Such a dodgy guy. What a yeah. dodgy guy. That People probably explains a lot. Lloyd will tell you that he, he loves him. And, and again, you can see why some people like him and some don't. Yeah, brilliant. I remember at Chesterfield, I'm sure he started off all right. And um, he used to always want to control like, the social media side of it as yeah, well. Yeah, he did. They had on Tano, is like when they were leading teams out, like who let the dogs out. Yeah. This is before all players have come out, and he's there like marching on. Like, <laughs> I can't remember what he used to put on website, Nick. Like, he'd, oh, uh, after every game, he'd basically put like a, a statement out. 
Yeah. And he'd always sign it off, take care, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's giving out players and all sorts, of money. Today we've, today we've signed an hard-working lad from yeah. Kettering. Who... It was a butcher's dog, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> Get Martin out yeah, he's, um, brilliant. he's done well at clubs. He's done well. He, yeah. he'll be a fit for some yeah. clubs and, and other clubs he's not, but he wants to run it from top to bottom. Yeah. Yeah, proper old old school manager, I think, is is the yeah. impression that you get. If, if it's all right, great. Before you go, we've got a, a little pro five quiz. It's all about your career. It's only five questions. If it's all right for us to run through that, of course. Yeah, it is. perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll just run through quick. So straight into it. Number one, you made over three hundred and fifty league appearances in your career. Who did you make the most appearances for in the league? Um, in the league, I would probably say Huddersfield. Correct, Huddersfield, 102. Second was Cheltenham with 89. So, yeah, not not a bad career, 350 appearances. Um, number two, you received just one red card in your career. Do you remember who it was against? Yeah, it was, yeah I do. It was, it was the Kidderminster. Yeah, correct. And it was against a team from North, it was a Northern team, as in Manchester area I think it was, am I right in that? No, you tested me This is where it's like Cornwall's. <laughs> no, it's not, it was, um, uh, it was like, uh, they're not even, I think they're even not even in the Conference North or Conference anymore, they're like really low down, I can't remember who it is. It's Eastbourne. Was it Eastbourne? Eastbourne, yeah. Went near the north. No I've one. got no idea. That's <laughs> yeah, no idea. That's terrible. How yes. coast is that? Like? Yeah, it's coast. <laughs> I thought it was someone else. Is that a south coast then? Or? Yeah, it is, yeah. I went <laughs> far off. <laughs> is it red, Craig? We always ask. Yeah, was it a deserved red? Say again, sorry? Was it a deserved red? We always ask as guests when we um, question. I thought it was a bit... Uh, yeah, I think it was a bit harsh. I think it was... The referee was, I think he was running over and he had his card out before he even got to the situation what had happened. So it was sort of a, a ball had sort of been played forward and it's one of them where you're chasing and closing down. And I'd won one tackle, I think I'd won another. And what had happened is the ball had gone to sort of the lad and he sort of just rotated, turned his back a little bit. And what I've done is I've jumped at the ball, but I've sort of wrapped my foot around the yeah. hook to touch the ball with my heel. So I did touch the ball, but it wasn't, so I didn't go through, it wasn't malicious, but the lad went down and I wasn't happy because I never got back in after that. Did you know? So it was was a three game ban and they were playing, they would have played sort of Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, I would have been back in. Mm -hmm. But because of the poor weather, it ended up being like a Saturday, a week later, the game was cancelled, another Saturday ended up being four weeks and then the lad who got in, uh, lad called um, Lee Baker, who used to be at West Brom, did really, really well and, and they went on a run and I think um, Yeti didn't want to change the side because they're actually doing quite well. Which yeah. Is a bit of a bummer. Shame. Yeah. Um, number three, you scored 14 goals in your career, uh, which is not a bad return, with your first coming for Nottingham Forest in a League Cup game, away it's against who? Away? It's, uh, yeah, it may have been home. Yeah, who was it? <laughs> Cambridge, wasn't it? Walsall, it says. I went straight in from the corner, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Go straight in from the corner, you're right. I forgot about that. I did, yeah, I scored one in the next round against Cambridge. No, sorry, the round before I scored against Cambridge. Oh, did you? Yeah. Was it away, Walsall? Was yeah, it was straight, straight from the cup. Do you know what? Um, so we I don't think we'd, I think it was, was it a two legged game? We'd, we'd, we'd drawn with them at home or we'd been beat, or beat at home or something like that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was so. We had a good side out as well, and we should have won the game. Van Hoydon was up front, I think. Kev Campbell. He scored the other one, didn't he, Van Hoydon? Yeah. I did set that one up, by the way. That won't be on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, number four, you mentioned it early. You had to wait a little while um, before your Forest debut. Who was your debut against? It was against Doncaster Rovers. It's, see, this were this were contentious as well because I had two websites, but none of them said Doncaster. One said Port Vale, and one said Swindon. They were both. They were two games. I don't know. I come on against Swindon away, but I, I 
played in it against Doncaster in the cup. So what, what on the, on the Wikipedia's you don't get the cup games and the appearances in the cup. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. So was oh, that a league debut? Did I not say league debut? I'm a league debut. Oh, I'm a league debut. Swindon. <laughs> <laughs> Swindon up, but well, we'll give you that point. Yeah, I think in a way, I think it was, it was, came off the bench and sw- swindling away. Yeah, so I ran a web, like a stats website said it was Port Vale, but there were like a forest dedicated site who had every player had ever played and who they played against. They said Swindon, so I thought they'll probably know best. <laughs> um, and five final question you made your Premier League debut with Forest in the 98 99 season and became a regular that year. How many Premier League appearances did you make? And it's a choice of three 18, 20, or 22. I made 22, I think it was. Yes, correct, spot on. I made 28 games that season before I sold, was sold, I think, including Cups. Yeah, we awesome. And that was uh, that was quite surreal, that because we just obviously got promoted and. Um, listen, I'll finish on this one. You'll, you, I think you might like this one. <laughs> Harry, Harry Bassett. So Dave Bassett is yeah. the best manager I've ever played for. Man manager. Really, really top guy. And possibly because he, he played me as well. Mm-hmm. And um, But he was brilliant. He was one of them. Listen, going away pre-season. We're going to play a game Monday, Wednesday, Monday night, Wednesday night, Saturday night. We'll end up in Helsinki on Saturday night. Make sure you bring your glad rags and have a night out. In fact, bring them for Monday, Wednesday as well. You can go out Monday, Wednesday. In fact, just bring clothes every night of the week. You've got every <laughs> night, as long as you get up for training. Right? Yeah. So every league game we used to play, we used to go in a room, flip chart comes over, the team would be on the board and you'd play like against Norwich and you'd have there, uh, Keith O'Neill played for Norwich, who was talented at the time. And he'd go, Stoney, he's a, he's a talented boy. He's, he's their best player. Mm. But a lot of the time, I used to go average, 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 just shoot at him, you'll score, you'll score against him. He's crap, he's their best player. It was, it was funny because he, he came into the club and said, you will get promoted. I, I believe what we got in this room, you'll win the league. Mm. You're better than the Crystal Palace side I had, you'll win the league. So we win the league that season. Unbelievable squad. What we had, Colin Cooper, who played for England, Steve Chell, obviously Alan Rogers brought him from Tramme, Steve Stone, Scott Gemmell played for Scotland. Mm. Van Hoydon, Kev Cap, brilliant squad. Well, it was great to be a part of that. Yeah. And I was quite lucky be- because... I was, I was gutted we lost all the boys we did because it meant that we would have stayed in the league, I think, if we hadn't lost the players. We'd lost that Premier League season. Yeah. It would have meant I wouldn't have played the games I played, but I would have learned my trade more. Yeah. And Harry would have still been in a job and, and my career might have gone a different way. Mm-hmm. But as, I, as it happened, it didn't. So we play, I play Birmingham in a reserve game on a Wednesday. Colin Cooper's injured. I'm playing against Arsenal on a Monday. So Arsenal have just won the FA Cup in the league. Double. So Harry Bassett in the room. I know I'm playing already. We're playing five, uh, playing four at the back, five in midfield. I'm playing holding midfield with Jeff Thomas and Andy Johnson. Hmm. A guy called John Cole Darshville up front who, who could catch pigeons, by the way. Yeah. Like, they're not just 35 on the left wing. Steve Stone on the right wing. Jeff Thomas, 34, 35 in midfield. Me make my Premier League debut. And obviously John Yelder playing at the back and... and it was a decent side. Anyway, Harry flips over this chart and he looks at the board and you've got, it's gone, David Seaman. World class. So bear in mind, every team player in the championship was shit. Shit. <laughs> gone, David Seaman, world class. You know, I know, I know he got chipped off Ronaldinho and that free kick and all that, you know, but, you know, world class. Now, Harry always speaks quick and he's gone, gone through, he's gone. Winterburn. Being unlucky as should have had more caps for England. Being unlucky because of Stuart Pearce and that that Aussie lad Derigo who couldn't should have been, but he's unlucky. He's gone. Dixon, another one, world class. Unlucky. Gary Neville, best full back. He's just unlucky. He's pointed at uh, um, I think it was um, Steve Bold and and Tony Adams. No, Martin Keown. He's gone. Martin Keown. Dash, watch him. Top top player. He'll kick you. He'll he'll, he'll bite you. Tony <laughs> Adams, world class. He's pointed to Petit and Vieira, right? Hasn't said the names. He's, he's looked, he's like that on the boys' dog. Banging the boys like that on the board. These two boys here are the best players in the league at the moment. They've just won the World Cup. <laughs> I would swap any one of you boys in this room for these two players. These two players are the best players. These are world class. Come. Over Mars, 
world class. <laughs> Ray Parler, he's gone, tank, Alan Rogers, tank, watch him. He's still a top, top player. And he's pointed at the board and you've got Bird Camp and an Elker up front. And he's looked at the board, he looked in the room, like he's just gone, lads, just face it, we're fucked. Come on, let's go. <laughs> That's amazing. I swear to God, like that's how I remember it. Unless someone comes and tell me I've just made that up, but that's how I remember it. And then we obviously went out and everyone goes, well, how did you get on? How did you get on? Yeah, we, we got beat 2-1, but we played well. We did play well. <laughs> but honestly, it was, that that was the guy he was. He, it, that that yeah. for me made me feel at ease and relaxed and, yeah, you know, and, and made us actually perform. So that's, you know, that's what I say on that. And that, that is a perfect, perfect way to end, Craig. Thank you so much. Oh, it's, been it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, you've been um, amazing, Thank you. Yeah, for for great you. Well, there. No worries, guys. Listen, I appreciate that. I've, uh, I hope things go well with the podcast. And, Thank you. Um, you know, stay safe and stay well and hopefully catch up soon. You too. Yeah, you too. Pie in hell. Pie in hell.